expression on the girls faces I can't imagine to see the sunlight to be Bro, around people. I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arms something is wrong here dead giveaway dead Charles, giveaway Charles thank you very dead much dead giveaway thank you very much for your time and hey guys I'm Jeremy and today I'm going to tell you a crazy story of a guy who kidnapped not one but three women and kept them in between about nine and 11 years in a house just behind me here in Cleveland, Ohio. So they were taken over a period of about a year and a half and were stuck there for all those years, were beat up, tortured, raped. So an absolutely insane story. So in this video, I'll show you some of the crime locations and I'll give you a background of this insane case. So the guy who did this was Ariel Castro. He was born in 1960 in Puerto Rico. And as a child, he was abused by a neighbor and some of his relatives. His parents got divorced when he was young. And then eventually he moved to the United States. They were first in Greeley, Pennsylvania, and then they moved over to Cleveland. So the house is just behind me here. I think it's a blue one. I think that was, because uh, it looks newer, the original house was actually torn down. So it was 2207, so 2204 is to the left, and 2120 is over there to the right. So yeah, that's where these poor girls were sitting, mostly in the basement at first, and then uh, upstairs, as I mentioned. So he eventually started dating a girl across the street named Gramilda, and they eventually ended up having four kids together and they ended up moving into this house back here in the, I don't know, 80s or 90s. And it was when they moved in together that the abuse really started on her. I mean, he had really beat the crap out of her, like broke her nose, ribs, and he had even hit her in the head so hard that she had a blood clot that ended up like becoming a tumor that was inoperable. And so she actually died later in uh, 2012 from that so of course there were some charges that were against him and there was even a grand jury, but they didn't indict him. And so it seemed like either the police or law enforcement or whoever kind of overlooked quite a lot of these things, which is really too bad because obviously if he was locked up, that would have been a lot better. So of course in the nineties, she moved out on her own. So they had the four kids together, like in another neighborhood, not too far from here. And in the 90s, he was a bus driver. Actually, almost until those girls were free, he was a bus driver. And he also played guitar in a local band. And, you know, everyone seemed like he was a pretty cool guy. He barbecued with his neighbors and hung out in the backyard. People said he was a little eccentric, but nothing too unusual. And actually, behind here, there's a cemetery, so they couldn't hear anything coming from that way. And also, behind that cemetery, it's not too far to that highway. So you could hear kind of the dull sound of a highway. So if people did hear some strange noises, they could think it's that, but it's definitely not like super quiet here. And so now I'm right behind the house, basically. There's a cemetery. And so they were able to get out occasionally in the backyard here. So there's just chain link fences on both sides, it looks like. So I don't know how they would be out there and like the neighbors wouldn't see them. But yeah, you've got this cemetery here and this would have been their view like pretty much i mean besides i don't know the other windows on this they could see the sides of the house but but obviously no one could hear back here besides the ghosts and whatever's on the highway and and then the uh, other house uh to the left of the blue here is where charles ramsey was he was the guy who actually came over and helped her besides the lady across the street so yeah in there for 10 years man scary it's also kind of interesting how this cemetery in a way might have actually provided kind of a negative role as far as not just the fact that no one lives here obviously like on this side but if they could see this area it's kind of a reminder of death all the time and i know obviously the girls were afraid of him and the ultimate thing they're afraid of is not just being tortured or beaten or raped it's they're afraid of being killed and if you see every day a bunch of tombstones and stuff that's kind of a creepy reminder of what could happen so michelle knight was the first kidnapped she was about 21 at the time she had a pretty tough upbringing and ended up having a kid when she was 17. so when the kid was about two the state ended up taking over because there was some kind of abuse i don't think it was from her maybe like a boyfriend or family member or something but 
So she was actually, at that time, trying to negotiate with the court about her kid's situation. And so she left her cousin's house, which I'll go over to that area in a little bit. And she was going for that custody hearing, basically. And she got lost on the way. And that's when Ariel Castro came up. He pulls up in his car and he's like, do you need a ride? And she's like, sure. And as they get in the car and go down the road, he's like, you know, I have some uh, puppies at my place. I was trying to get rid of them. Would you like to take one? She's like, great, yeah, I'll take one. They get to the house and she lost her freedom for almost 11 years. He beat her up and tied her up in the house and then dragged her down the stairs into the basement. Like her head was hitting the stairs as she went down. And then she was chained up there and brutally assaulted and tortured for years. She was actually down there for so long in the dark, like she actually has problems with her eyes seeing because of that, in addition to all these beatings and everything else. And the only thing he gave her was uh, TV that she could watch, which obviously is at least something to take away the monotony. But it must have been weird when like she sees on the news and everything that she's missing. And then of course the other girls who were taken later, they'd seen all these programs on the missing girls and their parents being interviewed. So that must have been really weird. I mean, at least it could give some people hope, but definitely kind of freaky. And Michelle never did call him by his name. She just called him dude. So she wouldn't give him that respect to even say his name, which is fair enough. At some point he got her a puppy and I think when he was trying to assault one of them, the puppy had like, you know, tried to defend the girls and he killed it like right in front of them. And so after several months, he felt comfortable with having her there. She, you know, obviously didn't escape or anything. And so he got an idea that he would try to take another girl. And that's exactly what he did. So eight months later, on April 21st, 2003, this girl, Amanda Berry, was going to work at Burger King that day. The next day, she was actually turning 17. So she finished her shift and she had called her sister. She was like trying to get a ride home. She couldn't get a ride, so she started walking. And so well, while she was going home, she's seen a guy go by with a girl that she had gone to school with. So a few minutes later, the guy comes back in the van. The girl's already gone. Like he had dropped her off at home or whatever. And he's like, you need a ride? And then they were talking about his daughter. And he's like, oh, do you want to see my daughter? We could stop back at my house. And so they got into the house and, and he said, he's like, oh, I think my daughter must be in the bath or something. Uh, I'll show you around the house for a minute. And it's pretty creepy because when he went upstairs, he actually opened the other door where Michelle was like laying in bed for a quick second. And then he brought her into the room next door and that's where he assaulted her and beat her and then brought her downstairs. And then in the basement, he put on a helmet which is kind of what he did with Michelle to like, if they're screaming, they can't hear as well. So they have this helmet and something in their mouth. And he mentions, just be quiet. I'll bring you home in the next day or two. So I'm here at Lorraine and 110th Street and right behind me is the Burger King that Amanda would have left that night. And it's actually just in front of me on the other side, which is Lorraine and 105th just you know three minute walk that way and that's actually where Michelle had left her cousin's house to go for that custody hearing so definitely in the same area so he must have been lurking around this area and I just drove down Lorraine Street I'm not sure which area the girls were going but it's definitely pretty sketchy like as a grown man I don't think I'd like feel super safe walking around here so if you're like 14 or 17 or like 23 definitely not the safest place to be and then Gina the last girl that was taken from her middle school she was up about another mile and a half or so that way so I'm not sure what direction she was going in she had 40 blocks to go so she might have been coming down towards this direction too his house is actually three and a half miles east of here so he's probably trying to go a little bit further from his home to find them and then bring them back. This also might have been a popular area to, for him to hang out because there's like a lot of shady things around here. So maybe he like hung out and drank or got prostitutes or did different things, who knows. But I don't know, this is where, the area where they were taken. And so in both these cases, um, the parents tried to get some help from the police. When Michelle was taken, her mother had called the police 
And because she had problems with the custody and law enforcement before, they didn't take it that seriously. So she had to do a lot on her own. So at first they thought Amanda was a runaway too, basically. And so they didn't do anything within the first day or two. And then about a week later, actually, Ariel Castro called her mom from Amanda's phone. And so she's like, I have your daughter. I'm going to give her back in a couple of days. So that gave some hope. But unfortunately, that didn't happen for 10 more years. And of course, over the years, they weren't just on the news. They were on like big talk shows like Montel and Oprah. And they even had a psychic come on who said that Amanda had died and that she was underwater somewhere. And then her mother had prematurely died, like about three years from when she was kidnapped. So that's horrible. Like she thinks her daughter's, you know, first kidnapped and then she's killed and she was actually alive. Super tragic that obviously it's not just these th three girls that were tortured. It's all of their family members and friends too. So about a year after that, he decides he's going to take another girl. And this girl's name was Gina DeSeuss. And if it wasn't bad enough to kidnap and do all these things to someone anyway, his daughter, Arlene, was actually friends with Gina. And he was friends with the father. So you know this girl's hanging out with your daughter and you know the father, and he still did this. And she was like 14 at the time, so super young. Because Michelle was about 23, and then Amanda was almost 17. And so he's basically getting younger as he goes. And so on April 2nd, 2004, she was walking up from Wilbert Wright Middle School and she actually had some money that she's supposed to use for a bus because it's 40 blocks home but she had like spent it on like lunch or snacks or something like that so she's walking and then she, ariel shows up and she knows him obviously because she's friends with his daughter and she thinks my dad must have told him to come and pick me up so he gets in the car and he's like you know we're, let's stop at my house real quick and as soon as they get inside he starts molesting her and she's like, I'm 14, like, you could get arrested for this. And he's like, oh, okay, well, you could leave. But if you leave, just go through the door in the basement, which is super suspicious. And then she goes down in the basement. And then that's when he attacks her and does the same thing. He basically chained her up. So most of the time, Gina was handcuffed or, like, tied up, attached to Michelle. So for several years, they were basically kind of, like, together. You know, they're watching TV, hanging out, like trying to enjoy it the best they can uh, under these horrifying circumstances. And over these years, Michelle had been pregnant up to five times, but miscarried because each time she got pregnant, he beat the crap out of her and she miscarried so much that she can never actually have any kids again. So that's really sad. And after about three years, Amanda got pregnant and she ended up having that baby. The baby was actually close to dying and the baby wasn't breathing for a bit and Amanda luckily saved her and the baby ended up being okay. And ironically, that actually kind of brought a little bit of happiness to the situation because Ariel was happier about it and it also brought some joy to the girls who were there. And things began to change in the house a little bit. Like he eventually brought them up from the basement and kept them barricaded in some rooms upstairs. And they were able to go outside a little bit more, like either into the garage or into the back. And I know one of the girls actually tried to get out and didn't make it over the fence. He got her and brought her in. And Ariel actually brought Amanda's daughter out with them to like Sunday service and to some friends and to his mom's place occasionally. He mentioned it was his girlfriend's kid. I don't think he said it was his biological kid, but he did bring the kid out um, all around town. So they only got one meal a day, so they were you know, practically starving the entire time. And then they got one or two showers a week, and that kind of depended on how good they were, basically. So in 2012, he finally got fired um, as a bus driver. He had been doing that for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And they're gonna foreclose on his house because he hadn't paid the taxes for about three years. So things were not looking good building up to that. And so one day he went to get groceries and the little girl, Julian, had come upstairs to Amanda's room and she's like, daddy's gone. She's like, okay. And the door was open to her room. And so she kind of went downstairs. She wasn't sure if it was a trick because often he would like leave a door unlocked or a little bit open and then wait for them to possibly go out. And then he, of course, attack them. 
So she was really nervous when she got out and walked down to the front door, and there was like a padlock or something on it. So she couldn't get all the way through, but she could yell, and she could kind of get an arm through, and the lady across the street first saw it and came over, and then this guy next door had come over and uh, helped her get out, basically. And that guy, Charles Ramsey, has a super funny interview I'll play right now. I'm talking with Charles Ramsey. He's a neighbor. Uh, walk me through again what happened this afternoon. You, were, you, you heard screaming. I heard screaming. I meet my McDonald's. I uh, come outside. I see this girl going nuts trying to get out of her house. So I go on the porch. I go on the porch and she says, help me get out. I've been, I'm, I've been in here a long time. So, you know, I figured it's a, a domestic violence dispute. So I open the door and we can't get in that way because how the door is, it's so much that the body can't fit through, only your hand. So we could kick the bottom and she comes out with the little girl and she says, call 911. My name was Amanda Berry. Now, did you know who that was when, you, when she said that? When she told me it didn't register until I got to call the 911. And then I'm like, I'm calling the 911 for Amanda Berry? I thought this girl was dead. You know what I mean? And, and she got on the phone and she said, yes, this is me. And the detective, uh, Cook, right here. Detective Gregory Cook says, Charles, do you know who you rescued? I said, I said. Now, and when did you see, when did you see Gina? So About five minutes after the police got here. See, the girl Amanda told the police, I ain't just the only ones. It's some more girls up in that house. So they went up there, you know, 30, 40 deep. And when they came out was just astonishing because I thought they were going to come up with nothing. I figured, I mean, whoever she was, and like I say, my neighbor, uh, you, you got you got the, some big testicles to pull this off, bro. Because we see this dude every day. I mean, every day. How long have you lived here? I've been here a year. Okay. You see where I'm coming from? Right. I barbecue with, with this dude. We eat ribs and, and whatnot and listen to salsa music. You see where I'm coming from? Yeah. And you had no indication that there was not anything going on? Bro, not a clue that that girl w was in that house or anybody else was in there against their will. Because how he is is I just, he just comes out to his backyard, plays with the dogs, tinker with his cars and motorcycles, goes back in the house. So he's somebody that you look and you look away because he's not doing nothing but the, the average stuff. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. There's nothing exciting about him. Well, until the day. <laughs> what, was, what was the reaction on the girls' faces? I can't imagine to see the sunlight, to be Bro, around Bro, I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arms. Something is wrong here. Dead giveaway. <laughs> Dead Charles, giveaway. Charles, thank you very Dead much. Dead giveaway. Thank you very much for your time. And either she homeless or she got problems. That's the only reason why she run to a black man. Charles, thank, thank you for being there, man. Charles Ramsey, neighbor, heard the screaming, took action, went and did what he needed to do. The rest is unfolding before us here on CMR. I'm going to send it back to you. So, of course, he goes to jail. The girls are released and super happy. Michelle even mentioned when she's in the hospital, she's she has to like worry even about asking a basic thing. She's like, is it okay if I have another granola bar? And they're like, of course, you can have as many as you want. But she's just so used to being under this control that she can't feel comfortable at all, at least at that time, of course. And he, he first pleads not guilty, and he didn't take any responsibility. He said the girls were sex addicts like him and that it was consensual. It's like, yeah, right, dude. And he also blamed the police. He said, well, the police should have figured this out a long time ago. So he blamed the police. He said that the girls wanted to be there. And eventually he was going to face a death penalty. And that's finally when he pleaded to avoid the death penalty. And he got his sentencing, which was hundreds and hundreds of charges for kidnapping and assault and rape and so many other things. And he was only in prison for two months and he hung himself. So he got the easy way out, which sucks. It would have been great if he at least did 10 or 11 years. I mean, of course, it would have been, he sh I wish he would have spent his whole life in prison. But I imagine in prison, like, he was really getting messed with from the beginning. He's like, I'm not going to do, you know, 30 years of this because it's going to be a really rough ride for him. And so. He was obviously on suicide watch, but he had somehow been able to end his own life. He was 53 at the time, and ironically, his oldest daughter, she ended up it's like getting charged for assault and attempt of murder, and she's serving 25 years. So that's kind of crazy. 
the rest of the family obviously apologized to the girls for everything that happened to them. And then Gina went off to work on the Amber Alert. So when there's missing people, they can have this alert and try to find them as quickly as possible. And then Amanda works for Fox News for the segment on missing people. And they all had books that they wrote that did really well. And I think most of them got married by now and like had kids. Of course, Michelle couldn't have kids. And she actually maybe tried to get her son back because remember, she had that kid that was in foster care who was about five at the time. So I imagine he was like 15 or 16 and you know, he's already been there that long. They're not gonna pull him out of the house. He's actually almost an adult at that point anyway. So my final thoughts on this, I wish I could just say like, never get in a car with a stranger. It's pretty obvious, but at least two of these girls knew this guy. And it also at that time, cell phones weren't as popular in the early 2000s. So nowadays I would say, you know, take a photo of the car, the person, and text someone before you leave so people know like where you're going or something about you. But at that time, that wasn't quite as popular. But in general, it's good to keep people updated of what's going on. You never know when something like this could happen. So send updates, I'm going here, I'm doing this. Like for instance, if I'm going off hiking in some weird location, if I don't have like a personal locator beacon, I'd say, okay, I'm off on this trail. If, if I don't turn up, at least you know where I was going. So really sad case. Um, obviously happy that these girls are able to move on with their life. It seems like they're doing pretty well despite the circumstance. And it's tragic that Ariel didn't spend his whole life in jail, but it's just the way things go. They actually ended up tearing down that house uh, like a year or two later. And one or two of the girls came to watch it get torn apart. It must've been pretty emotional. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.